The first one of two of that double feature is for Killer Clowns from Outer Space! This will be uh, by far the most colorful panel uh, in, in more ways than one. I see we have a, a few of our friends from Outer Space joining us. Hello, fellas. Um, this is also the kind of most robust, packed panel that we've had uh, all of, of Texas Frightmare Weekend this weekend. Uh, that is, of course, because uh, the fine folks at Frightmare have put together uh, what is, could be the, one of the most complete Killer Clowns reunions for the 35th anniversary. So who's ready for In Space? No one can eat ice cream! <laughs> This visionary film, uh, Charles Kyoto, Edward Kyoto, and Stephen Kyoto. So, so as I said, this is a packed panel. So I'm gonna stand. Uh, we ran out of chairs, and we only have enough mics, and so some people are going to have to share, and we figured since you're brothers, and you probably grew up learning about sharing with each other, Hell that should be you. Uh, but let's bring out the rest of our cast, Grant Kramer! So we'll just start off, um, just to read the room, uh, does anyone have, uh, I believe it's pronounced calrophobia, which is actually the medical term for a fear of clowns, because you're in the wrong fucking room, <laughs> if you do, I mean, look, there's a Pennywise walking in, what other, what other place other than Texas right now we could, could you see? Pennywise, the Killer Clowns, and Art the Clown from Terrifier any night. So there's a Joker, and then, yeah, there's a Joker, there we go, round two, sir. Um, wow, uh, this is amazing. Uh, I want to start uh, with the brothers down here. Um, given what we know, uh, a kind of glimpse into your collective psyches from the vision and the aesthetics and all that is Killer Clowns, what was it like, uh, a Kyoto childhood, uh, uh, the, the household of the Kyoto family, take us through it. What kind of, what was that uh, growing up situation like? We were watching monster movies. Yeah, Woo! it was uh, the classic King Kong, it was Godzilla. Meeting Joe Young, all the great movies of Ray Harryhausen, which is in bed, just in your archives. Willis O'Brien, all those names, and we didn't know how they were done, but we were drawn to them. Mom and Dad saw it, and they took us to see 20,000 Leagues, uh, not uh, 20,000 Leagues, a piece of 20,000 Fathoms, Giant Behemoth, all those movies, Journey to the Center of the Earth, Seven Voyages, Sinbad, they got it. And they don't you? And, and then we were down in the basement making movies on our 8 millimeter <laughs> camera, then we went to Super 8, and we started making monster movies around the, the neighborhood. We did go to the circus, but I didn't have a horrible experience. <laughs> I did. <laughs> <laughs> we, we can tell. Uh, uh, so parents, like Catholic let this, circus. <laughs> <laughs> parents let this be a lesson. Uh, support your kids. Support their weird loves of things because they could grow up to ruin people's childhoods. One day. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> it's, 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 it's incredible what y'all have done. I, I can think of very few um, horror filmmakers, just filmmakers in general, that, you know, beginning to end, top to bottom, the vision started and ended with you, but then you actually did it. I mean, the aesthetics, the, the kind of cotton candy, neon world of killer clowns, um, all the effects, everything. Uh, you were a one-stop shop. Um, how early on did that aesthetic kind of emerge, and was it always there, and how did it develop and evolve? I, I think it comes from what we grew up with. We grew up in the, the, the time of the vintage Looney Tunes, the Warner Brothers. The Three Stooges, The Little Rascals, Hal Roach, um, 
uh, you know, and, and uh, Mad Magazine, Martin Trucker, Jack Davis, all those images stayed in my mind. And basically they come out whenever we have a project. I impart the characters that I love into what we do. Yeah, and then there's also the sci-fi movies, uh, Forbidden Planet, uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, The Crawling oh, Eye. So it's really an amalgamation of all of those things put together. And all we want to do is just make a movie that we wanted to see. Yeah. So, yeah. so happy you guys like it. And when you come up with a title called Kill the Clowns from Outer Space, it sort of writes itself. You know? it's just like, <laughs> oh, 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 mind is the opportunities of all the clown circus, mind, you know, just imagery out there. And just kind of riff and have fun. Yeah, you make a list of everything that you see in a carnival and a clown and a circus, you know, and then you say, how can we mess that up? How can we can give it a Keanu Brothers twist? Or a candy coated kill, as we call it. <laughs> so, so, you know, you're writing, you're directing, you're doing the effects, uh, that's your background, you're developing this, and then how was it much of a fight to say, but we have to be the guys all the way. We have to do all of this stuff. Um, this is the kind of delineation or divvying up of the work of who's going to do what, but this is the only way the movie gets made if we do it. The trans world experience was they didn't even know what we were giving them, yeah. so they let us alone in terms of that. The problems we were having is, you know, in terms of scheduling, and they wanted to take shortcuts and stuff, but they didn't appreciate or understand what we were doing. Yeah, and it's funny. They, uh, luckily, they were having a big problem. Um, movie in production was in Sri Lanka, so all the executives were out of the country when we were shooting this movie, so we were kind of left for our own. But, you know, um, they did trust us when it came to the effects. That's one of the reasons why they, they wanted to make the movie with us. So we called in every favor on all the effects artists, talented people that we know and loved and worked with. And so they did this like an incredible solid to bring the art to, of this movie to life. We couldn't have done without, you know, Gene Moore and Leslie Huntley from Fantasy II, Dwight Roberts. Uh, Joe Viscoso. Yeah, Joe Viscoso. He blew up the ice cream truck and he blew yeah. up the, uh, the dead star. The dead star, you know. So we had this amazing talent. And uh, again, the tranquil people didn't kind of have a clue as to what all that was. They just let us do it. and. Uh, but it was different than our other productions. We didn't do everything. In fact, it was our first motion picture, so we had a crew of people. There were a lot of talented people, makeup people, got, uh, teamsters, somebody had to drive those trucks, and a DP, so it was like a really great community. And of course, our actors. Uh, before, we had always had uh, our neighborhood people were our actors, or our puppets that we animated frame by frame were our actors, but instead we had a wonderful cast of characters that helped us bring killer clowns to life. And they bring themselves into it, and they make it better. So, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, absolutely, yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm curious on both sides for the, the gentleman that kind of, you know, uh, gave birth to, to this, and then for your experience now, 35 years later, you know, aesthetically, you know, of course, there's many horror films that have become iconic for their characters and their costumes and everything, but I can't think of another horror movie that the whole world has been kind of iconic. It's given us action figures and video games and Halloween Horror Nights, haunted houses and you know uh, all kinds of crazy spin-offs. It's informed kind of a whole vibe, if you will. What is that like to kind of see that world, you know, of color like splash off the page of what you created and what, what y'all lived in all these years later? Oh it's absolutely amazing. We never expected this. Yeah, you know, like Stephen said before we spent a movie that we would like to go see. And the fact that it resonates with you 35 years later is really a testament to you guys, you know? Especially the horror community. It's not really a horror film, it's more of a sci-fi comedy with a lot of horror elements, but I'm really glad that you guys embrace it the way you have over the years. Yeah, it's really thrilling and, uh, and humbling to realize that you've touched the nerves of so many people, you know, and we share, we share the laughter, we share the fears, it's neat. You know you've really made it with a, a horror film when you become Immortalized in Halloween decorations. <laughs> when you're, when you're, um, when when you know you have trick or treat on one side, and then killer clowns basically keeping spirit Halloween in business Ooh. every year. You know you've done something right. So yeah. yeah. What, what what about what about y'all? Because coming in as actors, this is a weird, wonderful, wild world. You know that, that has to be so fun to play in. What was your first experience coming into this movie, being like, what have we got ourselves into here? I thought the Kyoto brothers were insane. I thought, I thought they were the craziest people I had ever met. I mean, they're they're totally normal, but they're they knew what they wanted, and we were just we were pawns, right? I mean, they they literally was like, we need you to do it this way, and why? 
um, you know, well, because I got this, this, this thought that it needs to be done this way, and they were right. You know, anything is an actor. Sometimes a director will tell you to do something, and you know it's not going to work. Well, Stephen would say things sometimes, and you think, that's not going to work for me, right? I mean, it, all of it did for all of us. Uh, I, I mean, hats off to these three men. They're remarkable. Um, so if you want to ask a question, go ahead and uh, line up here and we'll get with you in a second. Um, I have to imagine for the cast that getting to walk onto set and, and just see everything, this like crazy neon cotton candy world, it must have been this weird juxtaposition of like, oh my gosh, this is so fun to play in, but kind of terrifying at the same time. What was that like, just kind of living in this world as, as you're making a movie? Well, we were, we were kind of pretty into it even before the movie started. I think uh, we got invited to go out to their um, studio, their workshop, um, while they were still kind of sculpting all of the masks and everything like that. So, um, at least for me, it was really exciting because I knew we were, we were, it was, they were so creative and they were, uh, they were, you know, making all of these super cool creatures. And then when we were on the, uh, we were shooting the movie, we were shooting all night shoots, but they were actually, they had a warehouse um, that all the interior spaceship stuff was in. So that was all being painted and created while we were there. So that was pretty cool too. So we couldn't wait for the last week when we actually went into the spaceship sets and started, uh, you know, we saw filling up the balloons and the, 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 you know, the ballroom and all that different kind of stuff. And, uh, and so it was, it was, Super cool, and we were, I think, just all a little bit in awe of, of all of the uh, creative madness that was happening around us. Yeah, absolutely. Did, did any of you uh, get to go through the Halloween Horror Nights house? I did. I, I went with you. Yeah. yeah, so I'm curious what the, the kind of parallel of that experience of like you're making a movie, obviously, the movie comes out and we watch this movie. And it's fun and it's scary because we're experiencing it as a movie. But on set, you know, you're action cut, you're kind of getting taken in and out of it. But then getting to experience it <laughs> going through the haunted house must have been kind of like a new level of terror. Uh, what was that experience like? Was that kind of like surreal in a way? So I got to go through it with my son. Yeah. So that was really fun. And it's, uh, you know, you make a film as an actor and then it does this, and you don't really realize the effect that your performance and the film, the film that you made, can have on others. You're, you know, you do your work, and you're making friends with people, and um, I think going through Halloween Horror Nights was the beginning of really understanding just what had been created. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely, yeah, for sure. Okay, I'm gonna because we're short on mics here. I'm gonna come down. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna hang out down here. By the way, if nobody's ever been to that ho the Hollywood Horror Nights. They did a freaking amazing job. I mean, no, they were all blown away. I mean, yeah. the, the, the amount of work, you know, the even the down to the smells and everything yeah, it was pretty. Walking through the movie. Yeah, yeah walking walk through the movie. Through the movie. Yeah. for us was like being back on set. Actually, it felt like we were back in Sanders. Yeah. Oh, I imagine for you, for you guys especially. Yeah. This whole world you created, and then somebody took it and recreated it. Pretty surreal. Bonkers. Walk through the movie. Yeah. Okay, so, uh, hi. Uh, it's your name, and uh, that's your question, name. Uh, First up. Uh, my name is Price. Thank you so much for being here this weekend. It's my pleasure to be all of you individually. You brought so much joy on me and my wife, and so many episodes. Oh, uh, my question is the popcorn guy. 
We all know it was the most expensive, practical effect in the movie. I told you that. <laughs> I have two, uh, it's a two-part question. Number one, being the most expensive practical effect in an actual working popcorn gun that shot popcorn, how fast did the popcorn shoot? And for all of you, was there any behind-the-scenes popcorn gun shenanigans that went on during the movie shoot? No. You know what? It was an expensive prop only because uh, it's before I learned that you can buy pre-existing, pre-fabricated containers, plastic containers, and modify them instead of building from scratch from a drawing. So I learned that lesson from Philip Foreman, uh, the art director on the film. But uh, no, it's, uh, it, uh, but as far as as fast as it can go, a little bit faster than Mike and Debbie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> nobody, got, nobody got shot by it. We just built the thing so an air mortar pushed the, uh, the popcorn Actually, out. The only person that got shot by it was the guy that built it, uh, Kim Bailey. When he was testing it, he didn't seal the back side, so when he pressurized it, the back end blew off and gosh, hit him in the gut. <laughs> I the popcorn a huge welt. <laughs> he, he might have been the, the fatality from the popcorn. <laughs> Those little pieces of popcorn were kind of scary. <laughs> <laughs> so no, no uh, offset shenanigans with the gun. Just yeah. uh, use it for filming. Goes home and kind of kept it as a pet. <laughs> <laughs> I don't. They didn't know that either. So they're like, "Where's that gun?" Uh, hey, how's it going? Hi. Hi guys, my name is Chris. Uh, I had a question about the makeup effects in the movie. They looked really demanding, like it, it really was a, uh, took a lot of time to apply and to maintain. I was just uh, curious uh, how yeah. that went for. It wasn't, it wasn't makeup. We made uh, uh, four skulls and a clownzilla. We made castings, one for a, uh, a walk around that blinked, and the other for a puppet head that would be manually manipulated and blinked and had some facial expression. Yeah, other than that, the only extensive makeup we had was the lipstick from the female clowns on the Terenzi Brothers. <laughs> <laughs> and some really big balloons. <laughs> the, uh, the makeup that we used is a simple makeup for Don Vernon when he was transformed into the, the living ventriloquist, or the dead ventriloquist, <laughs> um, uh, the, the cheeks were the thumbprint of the clown dipped in Mooney's blood that was put on his face and the lines of the ventriloquist dummy mouth were his running blood so he didn't know that. Thank you. Thank you. Hey, how's it going? Hey guys, my name is James. Uh, thank you so much for making just a 90 minute fever dream that was so entertaining. Um, my question is for the Kyoto Brothers. So we saw a giant clown, shadow puppets, living balloon animals, popcorn guns. Was there any insanity that you had ideas for but weren't able to get into the final product? We were trying to get it in the sequels. Yeah, yeah, yeah actually, uh, they were. There were uh, yeah. quite a few that uh, we were not able to do. Yeah, like the, the original, the first draft of the script. Um, a, lot, a lot of the clown interior was based on uh, amusement park rides from the uh, parks that we grew up to ride the planet yeah. specifically. And uh, the ending of the movie, when the clowns come off the cake and attacking our main cast, they were supposed to be on a giant churn cable. Remember those? Was faster and faster, and they're holding on the center. And they got all the clowns waiting in the perimeter with all their weapons for them to be flung off and uh, dealt with in a clowny manner. Yeah, the <laughs> do. Didn't allow it. We can do it. We can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Hey, how's it going? Hey, good. So, you got a question for the brothers, and I know it's still a clown panel, but. Uh, Critters related. Uh, I was curious to have your general experience creating the puppets for the third movie. Were there any shenanigans, like maybe sharing each other with the puppets, or was it like making them? Making them is something you do in, in, in the uh, studio, and you know, in the lab, you, you, you cast them, you paint them, and stuff. The difficulty is the puppeteering on location, right? Yeah, I guess you know, it, was a, uh, it was the first time we keyed a show, meaning that we did all the critter effects. And it was a serious job for us, and there was not very much fooling around. It was pretty harsh. Yeah, I mean, you can probably, like, the, the, the worst thing that happened was puppeteers kind of like the, the bottom of the food chain. So we were shooting at night in a house they built that had uh, was built raised so we can get up underneath the floorboard. So we're underneath there one night, 
and uh, we have a little monitor so we can see what the camera sees to you know, get the public hearing proper. And then all of a sudden it gets really quiet and nobody's there. They all, went, they all broke for lunch and nobody told us that we were for lunch, so they left us all in the house. <laughs> and there were rattlesnakes out there, too. Thanks. Hey, how's it going? Uh, hi, guys, I'm Zach. Uh, hi. My question, uh, which you mentioned earlier, uh, any good horror film needs a sense of gravitas. Can you talk a little bit about the casting of John Vernon and what it was like to work with the man? Just because the guy is such a legendary actor and so impactful, I want to know if you have any good John Vernon stories from the set. Well, I, I have a few, but I want to pass that on to uh, John. Yeah, John and, and uh, Suzanne. I think he was intimidating as heck. Yeah, yeah. I think he's uh, You know, it's, you know, he came with all that gravitas from his other roles. and. And you know, to, to, the man walks in a you know you walk in a room and you you felt the power from him. He had a he had a presence that was undeniable. I think that's what made him a, a star. I think that's what made him, made him so compelling and so perfect for this role. You you bought that he was that guy. Um, yeah, for sure. And uh, when I had my scene with him, and you know, he would just say whatever he said. You were afraid of him, and he made you mad. You don't really have to act. No, he, no, was, no. he was just doing it. Yeah, 100%. He, uh, he just brought it. And yeah. You had to. And we were all young actors, you yeah. know, and we were doing, you know, doing our best, right, Grant? And it was yeah, like he made it. He made it simple because he, really like I said, he really was. He did. He did have that amazing aura of. Uh, I mean, the one he brought with him, you know, we were all a little bit in awe of him as an actor because we'd seen him in, you know, Total awe, you know, yeah. Josie Wales and, and, and Dean Warmer House and all that kind of stuff. Um, but he really, yeah, he had that incredibly, um, he was the epitome of gravitas. But he was also really generous as yeah. a performer, really generous, and could kind of help you see the hole in the scene. Yeah, and, and keep you from falling through it. Yeah. <laughs> yes, absolutely. And, and for me, it was really great because I was a very new director, uh, directing real people instead of puppets. And I saw the comedy side too. There was that scene when he, in police department when he got sprayed with flour, that squirt. Well, first take was one squirt. And I was kind of happy with it. It worked the way I wanted timing wise. But he said, hold on, let's, let's try another take. And his instruction was if he wants, be open his eyes and then hit him again. <laughs> and that was comic. That was a great comic button for that scene. Exactly what he needed. Yeah. And then I just went again. Yeah. And he, he was uh, he was cool. He he understood actually. He knew it before we did what the possibility was. It, on his last night of shooting, he and I were hanging out, and he says, "You know, this this Mooney character. There's something there. You know that. You know, I did that Dean Warmer thing, and I, people love that character as nasty as he is. And I said, it doesn't got the similar quality. And then he pitched to me that he says." I think he should come back in a spaceship as a zombie. You know, <laughs> you know, like that would be a, zo a zombozo, the right guy. <laughs> in a clown universe, it's possible. Yeah. So, you know, if he was still around, we, you know, he might have been able to help us get a, a, a sequel sooner. <laughs> <laughs> he certainly could. Thank you. Thanks. Next this number? Yeah, yeah, yeah oh. there you go. Yeah, you. Hey, how's it going? Hi, my name's Clint. This is actually my first convention. And Woo! I met so many wonderful people today. Got so many great autographs. Uh, to say first, the whole you know shadow scene with the dinosaur scared the crap out of me. <laughs> but uh, the my question, the ventriloquism scene and the invisible car. How did those ideas come up? You know that the, the invisible car was the inception, the, the the concept that started the whole thing. Yeah, I was trying to imagine the most frightening image I could think of. It was me driving down a mountain road and having a car pass me. And who do I see? A clown. A clown <laughs> me where it shouldn't is frightening. Yeah, and you know what? In the collaboration, you know, when you're having a brainstorming session, so the next question is, well, what could be scarier than that? What if it wasn't in a car? Yeah, what, what kind of car would a clown be driving? He doesn't have a car. He's floating. Yeah, if he's floating, he must be from outer space. <laughs> and if they're out of space, why are they here? The killers, of course. <laughs> Can you guys imagine being in that room? <laughs> you know what? And it's it's totally important. logical to me. <laughs> but, and you take that idea, some people might say, oh, it's too silly. We ran with it. And thank you. Thanks, man. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being with us for your thank first God. convention. Yeah. Yeah, hey, how's it going? My name is David, and I have a question for the Children Brothers and a request for Grant. 
Uh, my first question is, oh, I am super inspired by the visual effects and you know, the costumes, the clowns, all of the everything. And one of my dreams is to go to San Francisco School of Arts and learn visual effects. And I want to know, what is a good start for someone my age so I can start prepping for that? Okay. Focus on what your, 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 I can see your strongest skill set is, whether it's writing, sculpting, painting, drawing. What is your strongest um, artistic uh, strength and, and go out into the marketplace that way? Yeah, and they want to direct do, do, do it, whatever you do. Like Charlie draws on everything. Every day he's drawing. I'm so getting find your passion and just <laughs> and, and do it. And keep doing it. You know, the beginning won't be great, but the next day it'll be better. And the day after that will be even better. Thanks, man. Good luck. I like you like a lot. I get to host a lot of these, and a lot of people will say, "I want to be a writer. I want to be a director. How do I do that?" It's like, "Well, you write, you direct." But I love that at Texas Writing there, there are budding effects people because uh, I don't think that's as clear of a path. Uh, you know, we do have great schools like Stan School and uh, Tom School, but uh, yeah, to, to all of you budding uh, effects maestros, you're you're in the right room asking the right questions with these guys. The second part, the second answer to his question was from. The actor. Yeah. How did? What do you pursue if you want to be an actor? Before? Yeah. Was that a question? Yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> the second part of his question. Oh, I'm sorry. What was it? What was yeah. that? You want to know how, how you pursue? You, you know, not just. Oh, how you get into acting? Yeah. Is that what the question was? If you wanted to do yeah. that. He's, he's right there. Well, well, depending on depending on uh, if you you're probably still in school, obviously, right? So. Probably the best thing to do if you're still in school is get involved in some of the school plays and things like that. And, um, I mean, listen, acting, you know, I'm not gonna lie to you, it's not an easy profession. So you have to kind of fall in love with it. And, and, uh, and uh, because you, you get a lot of rejection, you get a lot more no's usually than you get yeah. yeses. So you have to love it so much that you're willing to to uh, you know, wait through those no's to be able to get the yeses. Uh, I mean, for every, I can only speak for myself, but for every one role that I got, you know, I can't even count the number. I mean, now, I, now I'm a producer, for every one movie I get made, there's like 20 that I spend, you know, thousands of hours on that's just roadkill, you know, at the end of the day. So, you've got to love doing this. And if, you, if you love doing this, then you, you, like I said, I would get involved in plays and then, and then find out if there's a local acting class anywhere that you are. And eventually, you probably want to move to LA or New York if you want to really take it seriously, because I mean, to a lesser extent, Chicago. But if you're in, you know, to Second City and things like that. But but you you know you, you keep on taking that next step. But you start with the first one is just getting yourself into some the plays at your school and things like that. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, appropriate. Our first clown question of the day. It better be uh, A, funny, or B, weird. Uh, okay, all right, we'll go ahead anyway. I'm Michelle, I know I stopped by with y'all for a while yesterday with my friend over there. Um, I have a couple of questions. So the first one is for the brothers, and the second one is for the whole panel. But the first question is, I know y'all touched a little bit on a sequel, and it's, um, some of the things that have come up are series, you know, is there still a path for those? or kind of where, if anything, what's going on with that? There's always a path, because we'll make it. Uh, you know, it's, uh, you know it, it's, a, it's been a constant conversation for 35 years, you know, right now, uh, with the video game. Uh, on the of the um, it, could be, it could be a game changer, and uh, it'll help uh, show that there's a mainstream, wide audience for the project, you know. Cult Classic is great, but mainstream is better, uh, and, uh, yeah, I mean, uh, if we, we've got a, a we've got a, a lot of ideas. We have a great one we want to pursue. So, like in the extended series range, like eight, ten episodes in a Netflix or an Amazon situation. Um, and then we have some receptive ears over at MGM. So it's up to you guys. You guys keep on buying that merchandise. <laughs> 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 and if you want more clothes. No, but it doesn't. This this is what drives it. Conventions like you guys, you know, the internet, social media. That's it's what start a big, it. start a big internet, you know, Twitter campaign. You know, get the ball rolling. You know, just the critical mass, I think, is building. So, um, you know, we're hoping it finally reaches that point that they can't say no anymore. That would be awesome. I'm excited for that. Meeting. 
And then the last question for the whole group would be, um, what was your favorite part of either being part of the project or even just watching the project? Uh, I'll start. Yes. Well, I loved it all. But for me, there was the one night um, where we got to throw pies. <laughs> <laughs> for me, that was the pinnacle. To be able to throw, like, 20 pies at this one guy standing there getting smashed. <laughs> just absolutely smashed. And the guy was great. It was absolutely great. I think, did we do two or three takes or we do it all at once? No, it was, it was one. one. Oh, <laughs> oh, we did one take. It was Lots of pies. But it, it was such a thrill to, to throw pies at this guy. Just, we, just so you know, we were all, that, 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 those pies when they came flying, that was everybody in the cast and crew that wasn't actually holding a light or a camera with two pie tins, one each hand, and, and one, two, three, and then stagger them. Oh, oh, right? And that was everybody, so we were all super excited. I mean, you, you become goofy like kids. Yeah, the lesson learned is you never ask the clown, what are you going to do with those pies? <laughs> <laughs> Which, by the way, is my personal favorite line in the whole movie. Uh, I just, every time I hear that guy's, he was just a local actor, right? It was yeah, a, David Peel from uh, San Francisco area. I just have always thought that you couldn't deliver that any better than he, than he did. It's like hard to believe he didn't become a big character actor or something. Because he was like Sufi Sales or something. He was awesome. Yeah, he was great. I was impressed with the delivery of the lines on most of the cast. You know, when, when Debbie is trying to escape, he says, no one's going to put me in a balloon again. <laughs> and my favorite line is John's line. We can't leave now. There might be people still alive in these balloons. <laughs> but see, he, he nailed it because he took it serious. The lines weren't delivered as jokes. They were delivered as the world is being taken. There are people in, in distress. So that's what I loved about the performance. But by the way, um, just uh, kind of on the shoulders of what John said a little bit ago, we really were, uh, we had a lot of trust they had, Stephen and, and the brothers had a very, a very clear vision of what they wanted. And, and you know, especially with, with my character at least, um, they were always kind of pushing me to be that much, you know, more hyper, more, you know, excited. Uh, and, um, you know, at the time I was kind of in acting school and you're, you're being taught to, you know, be very down to earth and real and barely do anything. And so, um, I, but I, I trusted Stephen and I just kind of like went for it and then when you see it, it's like they were absolutely right with all of us, you know, they, they knew exactly what they were painting in their canvas and it all it just worked perfectly. Well, my particular favorite part was when they were talking about the floating clown because that's the, one of the bits I was able to do, uh, not and smash the car off of the road. And it was a great contraption that was made by the effects guy. It was a rig that was attached to the vehicle. Yeah, and it, I, I got a day of, to rehearse on it to learn how to control the uh, rig, and then it took us a couple of days to film it. But that was um, that was a lot of fun doing that one. For me, uh, the whole thing was just so surreal. I never knew what to expect, and uh, the epitome of that would be the day that we shot the uh, uh, sucking the blood out of the cocoon. <laughs> uh, and, and while we were doing it, and while I was sucking on the blood, and I watch it, I'm watching through my mask as the blood comes up to the straw. I'm like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> This is so surreal. <laughs> and then the other scene that got me was the, the popcorn gun scene coming out of the elevator. And uh, um, I had to have my, uh, the mask was actually uh, split down the middle of the back. It was really thick latex, maybe an inch, inch and a quarter, something like that. And uh, it, was, it was glued shut with, in my case, I don't know why, it was airplane glue. But it made the high of tight. And, uh, inside those masks, there's motors that control the eyes and the mouth. And there's uh, an operator who's controlling the facial expression while I'm doing the scene. And I just remember uh, the first take, I come out of the elevator with a popcorn gun. I kind of whip it out, and I'm supposed to fire the gun. And then Steven says, Harrod, Harrod, Harrod. Have you ever seen Rambo? I'm like, yeah. He goes, put Rambo in this. Come out of that with attention. Come on out. So I come out. I was playing college basketball just before. So I come out of the elevator. 
pumped. And I could <laughs> run around and shoot, and then I didn't realize there was a step off that was like a two, two foot step off. It was like a set. And I almost fell into it with my big 24 inch uh, clown shoe. Uh, <laughs> that was what the reality was like for me. It was, it was, it was surreal. It was, uh, it was just, uh, it was like being in a, in a candy shop on wheels. But the scene we did, what well, we all did, the scene with the, uh, the carnival house and everything was moving, everything was colorful, and there was like 15 clowns and we're all trying to be orchestrated. And, I mean, it was. It was as fun doing it as it is for you guys to watch it. And uh, I would just say, hey, come on. Let's get these guys what they need. Come on. Somebody out there in this world, get these guys what they need. And let's make another one. And they did. Yeah. And in the bathroom scene, before the... Uh, the, the, the popcorn clowns, the jack-in-the-box clowns, popped out of the hamper and out of the thing. She goes, these things are so, these things think, how am I going to stop from laughing because it's so funny. She said, you know what, you got to take it serious. You got to do it. You just got to do it. And she, she did it. But, you know, it, it, it is a silly thing. I guess the first take, you have to get the laughs out. <laughs> you did. But the teeth in the clown, they really hurt. Oh. <laughs> so that was easy. <laughs> Motivation. <laughs> so my favorite scene is the shadow puppet scene where they're doing all those different, you know, and then they devour the people that are I love that scene. Um, my favorite memory would be when we were all running through the fun house and they were holding my hands and trying to help me not wipe out in the in the balloons and everything like that. It, it was just really it was just a really fun show to work on. And my agent told me that these guys were just the most talented people and that I had to do this movie because it would be a cult classic. Wow. She told me that. She knew. She knew, yeah. But above all of that, having done the movie and having this family of friends that I love so much, that's been amazing, and then also getting to meet all of you wonderful people. It's really made me very special. Yeah, no, I, I have to agree with that. Um, as much fun as the movie was to make, and it was so much fun, um, you know, getting a chance to see, uh, to meet all the fans and see how much everybody's enjoyed this movie, and I have a little card that I pull out from time to time, um, which I think Suzanne has one pretty similar to it, but it's basically um, somebody who said, the card says, thank you so much, you know, this, this movie gave my grandfather so much joy, that he turned my father onto it, and my father turned me onto it. So now we're in third generation Cody Clown's family, and I just think that is the coolest thing. Wow. <laughs> I'd like to just say one thing, as you know, as you can see that my partner in crime is not here tonight. Um, uh, Peter Lacasse, who played uh, Paul Terenzi. Um, there, there's, a, there's a scene, and you guys will all know it. Uh, it was when Clownzilla was attacking the ice cream truck after it crashed through the wall. There was a line that Peter said that uh, he was so proud of. And uh, I'd like to kind of bring Peter into the room a little bit by saying that line. Now, Dave wanted us to get out of that van, and Pete had an ad lib that the, the, the Kyotos didn't even know about. He just threw it out there. Clownzilla was stepping down to kill them all. Yeah, and, and uh, Pete just poked his head out of the van and said, We can't! It's rented! <laughs> And they loved it so much they put it in the film. It was brilliant. Again, you could work with these actors like that. It was perfect. It wasn't written. It was just the perfect comedic button in that in that very dramatic scene to throw that line in. Nice. Thank you. Thank by you. the way, by the way, um, even though I say that uh, that you know we were so old that they were incredibly. Um, I remember us even before we shot the movie sitting by the pool up in Aptos, which is near Santa Cruz the little uh, the hotel, and uh, yeah. we were all walking, hey, can you, 
you think, Stephen, can I say this line? Can I change this a little bit? And he was open to all of that. So as much as he had a vision, he was also very into incorporating hours and even letting us. I remember one time when uh, I was in the in the truck with the uh, with the Trenzi brothers with Mike and Peter, and we we just started bantering that whole little thing about which way to go, left, you know, right, right, no, left, left, right, and that was just all like an improv that we just cooked up and. You know, you guys let us roll with it, right? And that worked great too, so. Oh, yeah, and I love when Suzanne just kind of flipped Officer Mooney <laughs> when uh, she left the police uh, station, I think. That was her. Because he was very disrespectful. <laughs> woo <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, you're up here, man. What's your name? <laughs> Wait, say <laughs> that again. perspective shots, putting a puppet, let's say, close to the camera against people in the, in the distance to make the puppet look bigger. And on Killer Clowns, we did the same thing. Yeah, we was brainstormed, a, did storyboards, yeah. and we did the same effects. You guys know the course perspective of a, of a lifelong dream, really. It's what we did as tell kids. Tell what forced perspective is. Yeah. Oh, forced perspective? You, you bring, let's say, a, a creature in front of the camera, you bring it closer to the camera, do it like this. You can do it with one eye. <laughs> your hand is big, I can pick your head like this. You know, that's what it is. The thing in the foreground is bigger than everything in the background. That's yeah. the course perspective. Yeah, but like you're saying, so again, a culmination of a lifelong dream for us. It was, again, we got to do what we were doing as kids on a real movie. And the, really the best part of it was our mom and dad who made it all possible for us. They got to come up during shooting during the last week and uh, they got to see their boys uh, uh, do what they enabled us to do. And we even had a logo back then. We had the other brothers and the brothers in the logo like an NGO lion. We could do it back in the 1960s. <laughs> All right, uh, here's our last three questions. Hello, sir. Hi, my name is Dan Michaka from South Texas. Woo! So this is for the Kyoto brothers. This is kind of a rather lame question, but 
Which one of these stickles came up with the concept of the cotton candy cocoons? You know, the, the cotton candy cocoons, again, it was the obvious thing that you, you would see <laughs> in a carnival or a circus, and we tried to figure out, you know, you know, what can we do? And then we, again, we loved uh, invasion of the body snatchers. And there was another one, the beast of the haunted cave, where the monster wrapped them in a cocoon and sucked the blood. So we put all that together and had a, a, a silly straw, curly straw, sucking the blood out of a cotton candy cocoon. It's all a compilation. Yeah, it was all a brainstorming. We would yeah. sit there and say, okay, what's about the circus or carnival motifs that we can kind of pull from? And we just started talking. Yeah, the two biggest things you get in a, a circus or a carnival is uh, popcorn and cotton candy. So. Those were the, those like the first things, things that just, you know. We are the guys who saw Invasion of Body Snatchers, and you said, I like this movie, but you know what it needs more of? Cotton candy. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, man. All right, your, speaking of cotton candy, your hair is appropriately <laughs> colored. Uh, segue, and then for our second and last question. You know what? I plan to play it, but I'm embarrassed to say I have to brush up a little bit. Yeah, we're not really gamers. We did play the game, a demo of it, and it's really great. Uh, the game company, uh, Good Shepherd Entertainment, they wanted to remake the, uh, the aesthetics of the original 1988 movie. So it has the same sensibility of uh, Press and Cove, the clowns. We were uh, executive producers and visual consultants, and the clowns look great. The yeah. clowns look so cool. The environments are great. It's foggy yeah, so nights. Yeah, there, there's gonna be a, it's supposed to be an announcement in July that's going to update us all. But uh, like part of the plan is when the game gets released, we're going to be online playing. And I'd like to team up with the cast once again and see if we can all play online and kill those clowns. <laughs> I think what's been so amazing is, is, you know, all of the killer clouds of Femera over the years since, it's always had your kind of DNA and your touch on it, and it seems like you guys have really stayed involved. Going all the way back to even looking into marketing and everything, you can, it can, you can always feel your presence amongst all of it, and that's why it's stayed consistent. Except yeah. one thing, uh -oh. from outer space, it's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> should have been a K. Come on. Yeah. It's also a slow day in the marketing department if you're like, what should the tagline be? How about, it's crazy. You know, I'd it's like, great. I'd like to also give credit to John Massari, who scored the thing so beautifully. I mean, that part of the 70s, that comes off the script, score, it makes, it makes the movie incredibly great. Yeah, By the great. way, it's the coolest artwork on that. Uh, it, 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 you guys have seen that uh, yeah. vinyl LP, right? It's yeah. just amazing. Yeah. I mean, it's so cool. It's about the coolest artwork I've ever seen in an LP like that. He's got one saved from that. So he was here. <laughs> All right, sir. Last question of the Killer Clowns panel. What is your name and what is your question? Hi, guys. My name is Billy. First of all, I just want to thank all of y'all for making this amazing movie that has created so many countless fond memories for me to look back on. So thank you all for creating Thank you. And uh, so I got two things to know. Um, first thing is on the off chance that there's a, in a perfect world where we do in fact get a sequel, is there any chance maybe some humans can accidentally crash land on their planet and we get to see their world? That would be the fourth season. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, the last thing I got uh, is for Charlie specifically. Uh, I just wanted to thank you one last time for uh, the hand you had in creating my Slappy Dummy. So oh. Thank you very much. You're welcome. I love the Thank you all again. <laughs> thank you guys so much. I appreciate you. That is uh, a perfect note to end on. Keep it going for the cast and filmmakers. And uh, this might be tricky, but we do this at the end of every panel. We do a fun cast photo. It'll be tricky with y'all. We gotta have a wide-angle lens. But please stick around for a couple seconds. Go crazy in the background so we can get you all in. Let's uh, kind of immortalize uh, this 35th anniversary panel.